This webinar is Implanting Nursing Calves. I'm Carla Jenkins, the Cal-Calf Range Management Specialist for the University of Nebraska out at the Panhandle Research and Extension Center. So a question that arises a lot when I talk to producers is does it pay to implant nursing calves? I hear things like, I didn't implant my calves this year. Last year, I think we got docked when we sold them because they were implanted. So then when I ask, how do you sell the calves, I get things like this. We don't sell our calves into a certified natural program or a non-hormone treated cattle program, but we don't implant. Many things impact the price of calves, including lot size, mixed lots, the geographic location of the country, flesh score, frame score, definitely body weight, whether or not the cattle are age and source verified, and other value-added programs, what vaccination programs they've had, whether they have horns and breed descriptions, as well as many other daily factors that may happen at the auction at that time. So how do we know if implanting really impacts the price that a calf is given. In a scientific paper published in the Professional Animal Scientist in 2015, a group of authors studied the effect of implanting nursing calves that were sold through video auction. They then took this information and they applied multiple regression statistical modeling so that they could account for all those many factors that impact the calf price to determine if whether or not implanting the calf really imp impacted the price that the calves were given on sale day. So this slide is a table that came out of that paper that they published in 2015 and it shows the implant status of the calves that they surveyed in 2010, 11, 12, and 13, the number of lots that they surveyed, and the sale price per hundred weight that those calves received, a regression coefficient, and a p-value. So essentially what, a re what the regression coefficient does is it helps us to factor out all the things that affect price that have nothing to do with whether or not the calf was implanted and then just compares whether there's a correlation between the price of implanted and the price of non-implanted. In this, in this case the regression coefficient for each year is very low and so it tells us that those are not correlated. There's not a connection between price and whether or not the calf is implanted. When we look at a p-value p-values tell us if the numbers that we are comparing, in this case the sale price for implanted versus non-implanted cattle, is different. So a p-value of 0 0.05 or less tells us that there is a 95% confidence interval or more that the differences that we see are real if a p-value is at 0 0.05 or less. In the case of each of these years, the p-value is much higher than 0 0.05, and so it tells us that the number, the sale price for implanted versus non-implanted is not actually different, that there's minor differences in that number, but those variations are not real differences based on whether the calf was implanted or not. So their study indicated that of all the factors that impact what a calf brings, implanting was not a factor. But we also noticed that even though that's true, the lot size of the implanted calves is much smaller than the non-implanted and suggests that only about 20% of our ranchers are actually implanting their calves before weaning. So what are the benefits of implanting our nursing calves if we're not getting docked at the sale barn for implanting them? Research has indicated that we can get an increase in 4-6% to of the gain between birth and weaning if calves are given a growth implant. So realistically, this could translate to 15 to 30 more pounds to sell at weaning. 
So this is some math that I did that obviously does not take out all the factors like lot size and flesh score and things like that, but just trying to look at some local sale barn results um, on a given day in a region for steers, and I tried to do similar lot sizes to just look at what does that calf bring as a total amount of money um, and, and then compare that to what if he had a little more weight on him, if he had weighed a little more going into that same sale barn on that same day because he'd been implanted, how much more would he have netted the producer because he weighed more? And so I did some comparisons there for calves that weighed about 514 pounds and, and what their total net was compared to maybe 530, 536 pounds. And then again down here, some that weighed 515, 516 at a different sale barn and, and some calves that weighed 536. And we see that most of the time um, that additional weight brought additional money. Here's another example from another sale barn. And we see that sometimes there's a little more to be gained for that extra weight than in other cases, but we see that for the cost of the implant, that extra money is worth it. So I looked it up to see what it would cost to get an implant. And a Ralgro calf implant, which is approved for a nursing calf, um, through Valley Vet on the internet was a buck thirty-three plus shipping and handling. So if it took if it cost me a buck fifty per calf by the time I got it here and got it in the calf, maybe it doesn't net us anything, or maybe it gets us another thirty to fifty dollars per calf for the extra weight that that dollar fifty put on that calf. And if that's the case, that's certainly a decent return on an investment. But if we're going to do this, we have to do it responsibly. Proper implanting strategies should not negatively impact the next segment of the industry. This is one of the criticisms that I hear is that, well, I sell my calves to a private buyer in the stalker segment and he doesn't want them implanted because he will not get any good out of an implant that he puts in. And that is incorrect. If the proper implant strategy is used and the proper ones are given in the nursing calf stage and then the proper ones are given in the stalker phase and then the proper ones in the finishing phase, everyone should benefit from that. So calves that are nursing that are going to be implanted need to be at least 30 days of age. And studies have not shown any negative impacts on heifers if they're implanted between two months of age and weaning, if they're implanted only one time. Um, but if you know you're going to select them for breeding, you could probably just avoid that. And calves that are going to be kept bulls for breeding should not be implanted either. We always want to start with the weakest implants first. Stronger, more aggressive implants can get, be given at each segment. Phar pharmaceutical companies have changed a lot in recent years and new implants have been developed. Not much is new in the nursing calf implant, but there's some new options for stalker and finishing cattle. Possibly this is because only 20% of the calves are being implanted. Maybe the pharmaceutical companies don't feel like it's worth it to develop better implants for that phase. So currently, Ralgro and Cinevex C are the only ones approved for the nursing calf. Implants for backgrounding calves um, that are approved are Revelor G, which is approved for grass cattle. Cinevex H or S could be given to growing cattle that are not intended for reproduction. But diets need to be better than maintenance for these to work. So if a producer is going to keep the calves after weaning and winter them at barely above maintenance, that would not be the time to give an implant. But then if the cattle are going to go to grass and are going to have a good plane of nutrition, that would be the time then to implant the calves. And they need to read on the box and know what the dose and the payout length is supposed to be when you're determining which ones to use. And we need to properly place the implant. It goes in the middle one th third of the ear. There are veins that run on either side of where this picture of the implant is shown. And, um, and so we want to avoid those veins. And we just um, want to avoid putting it too close to the ear so that the payout is too quick and 
too close to the end of the ear out on the tip where it won't pay out correctly either. Nursing calf ears are generally very tender, so you have to be very careful not to go through the ear, put your fingers under the ear and barely pick up the skin with the tip of the needle, slide it in and make kind of a, a little hole and then um, put the implant in. The needle needs to be sharp and uh, needs to be disinfected after each calf. There have been studies that have shown that infected implants do not pay out properly. It's also important not to hit veins or crush implant. So here's a fact for producers to share with consumers who say that they don't want the beef implanted. Um, a three ounce steak from an implanted steer has 1.85 nanograms of estrogen, whereas a steak from a non implanted uh, three ounce steak has 1.3. So there's only half a nanogram difference between those. All meat has hormones, so no meat is hormone free. Okay, so there's half a difference, half a nanogram difference between those two. By comparison, there's 20,000 to 50,000 nanograms of estrogen in a daily birth control pill. And that's a very socially acceptable practice. And so I think that consumers' concerns about the estrogen in implanted beef is just from misinformation. And as producers, we need to be able to share that. And these same people tend to want us to be careful with the planet and implants allow us to grow more beef on less resources, leaving less carbon footprint. So in summary, studies indicate the price for implanted calves is not actually different from non-implanted calves. Only 20 to 30% of calves are actually implanted and yet this is one of the best returns per investment strategies that we can make. If calves are not implanted, then we need to make sure we have a marketing strategy implant implemented to get a premium for leaving that weight on the table. More information can always be found at beef.unl.edu or by emailing me or calling me um, with the information on the slide. Thank you.